Hi. Good. How are you? Thank you for organizing this. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I remember your talk uh, in San Francisco last year, and I really liked your model. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I love your, you have such a deep understanding of this topic. So every time I listen to you, I learn something. And so yesterday I, I watched your talk and I have a number of questions for you, but um, I'd like to give like the audience a little bit more information about you, what you're working on, and then you can like lead into the fair uh, or the safe way of building bots, as you call it. So tell us, <laughs> tell us more. Sure. You know, um, why? Uh, you know, I teach several courses in university. Meanwhile, I'm running my company, right? right. And we have done so many chatbot virtual system projects. Mm -hmm. And you know, the teaching, the course I teach in the university includes system analysis and design, generally how to develop softwares. Also, yeah. machine learning for natural natural language processing and data mining. Those are courses you can see they have combining of developing products. Meanwhile, AI and then normally, if you actually want to develop something good, a uh, software, you need to follow a certain process, right? mm -hmm. a standard software lifecycle management process, um, like use case design, process design, and project management, and so on. And then when it comes to developing virtual system, it's a software. It's kind of a software, but with its special characteristics of like there are uh, technical risk. And uh, because virtual system isn't usually not deterministic, it's like a human, right? And uh, how do you know you are going to build a virtual system that's the future? We actually think mm -hmm. future is AI workers. How do you know you are going to build a good one? Right? Mm -hmm. And you need to understand the what's special here and then have a methodology tailored to what's special about the virtual assistant and to systematically organize projects and anticipate or, um, possible risks and the potential what's needed there in the future, in short term and in long term. That's why we introduced this SAFE model where SAFE stands for smart, automated, and fast and extensible. A methodology, things you need to pay attention and follow when developing a virtual assistant. Okay. Right. And SAFE model is well motivated based on the idea that a virtual assistant, a future AI work and they should have certain characteristics like human workers. Um, and people have expectation about AI workers. So let's, let's build a virtual system, meet the expectation. Got it. Can, can you talk about each one of those uh, elements more? Because uh, some of them are going to be very easy to do, or I should say much easier to do, and some of them are going to be much harder to execute, right? Yeah. What do you think are the easy part and harder part? <laughs> Well, it, so that's too subjective for me because I'm not like an NLP engineer or, mm -hmm. or NLU. So for me, that part will be the harder part. Mm -hmm. And the conversational uh, UX and design will be the easier part for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that for Alex, it might be maybe all of it's much easier. And for you, maybe all of it's much easier. But, it, it, you know, if you could talk about each uh, part of it. Yeah. Sure. Be. You know, for the safe, uh, the first part is being smart. The virtual assistant should be smart. And because um, AI assistant must behave according to a certain norm, convention of human interaction in order to make themselves understood and useful. That's why it's done. Although I have been doing AI for more than 25 years, I yeah. still think it's hard. <laughs> it's still hard after 25 years um, because uh, and the agent uh, virtual assistant need to understand human language and uh, also need to take uh, good actions and understand, uh, stand human and which involves understand, have domain knowledge, right? Have word knowledge, common sense, which is not said. And also have discourse understanding about the conversation context and take actions. Um, all those things combine together in a coherent way to make a smart uh, virtual assistant. It's hard. Mm -hmm. And like autonomous driving car, uh, although, you know, 25 years, 20 years ago, when we, when I was PhD student in Carnegie Mellon, we have virtual assistant. We work on virtual assistant. Oh, and then we also have my classmates working on virtual, uh, autonomous driving car. And after 20 years, and uh, the virtual assistant uh, state of art is on level three. Um, last year I talked about level one to level five and autonomous driving car is also not far from level five too. Um, it's, it's in general hard. 
But on the other hand, um, in my talk, I talk about the five levels. Once you can eat, reach level three, you have a pretty decent virtual assistant because you have the technology to handle variation of conversation, uh, conversation flow and the variation of natural language. Both variations, you cannot enumerate all of those. And the bot will be considered dumb if you use rules to handle those variations instead of giving people the flexibility to, to talk with the bot. Uh, so that's, um, so if you are interested, the audience are interested in talk, there are details about the five levels of virtual assistant intelligence that give us, give you a guidance, say, okay, is the technology I'm using actually a state of art or not? Mm -hmm. For example, if it cannot handle variation of conversation flow, cannot handle context switching, uh, user express multiple intents in one or two sentences in one term, and mm -hmm. also cannot handle mixing multiple tasks together in order to get a problem solved, then it's not an in level three, mm -hmm. which we showed um, it's possible to build a level three bot. Right. And, and uh, the, that's the first part, being smart. Um, the, the second part is automation. Automation is uh, now p companies are, talk are talking about automation and uh, you have uh, some talk talking about robot process automation combined with conversation AI. That's uh, related to what we mean. What we mean, combined robot process automation uh, with conversation technologies. And when you can, right. The layer, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at it, uh, we actually think uh, automation is an essential part of virtual assistant or what we call an um, AI workers for the future. Because as human, human worker, we have brain, we have our body, right? And you need a body to take actions to get things done. And so you cannot just have a brain and do nothing. Uh, of course, the, for virtual assistant, having the brain, brain to, you can answer some questions to provide the information. But the next <clears> important <throat> thing is to take action, get things done. That's why we have the second component, automation. <laughs> and the third component is uh, fast. Like, although maybe in this field, people get used to spend months or years to build a virtual assistant, to build it good. But yeah. if you say, I'm going to hire this employee and it will take one year to train the employee, you probably will be, are you going to hire the person? No, you don't want, right? And especially if you have new things, you want to move this employee to do new things and everything in, now in coronavirus situation, yeah. and things are changing on a daily basis. And this employee need to be adaptive quickly, be fast learner to adapt to the real scenario. The same for AI employee, AI workers. That's why the third component say you need to have the technology and the prepared to it to have the AI worker, the virtual assistant to be fast learner, fast learner. And, uh, and based on our experience, we believe it's feasible because of two things. One is pre-trained language models. Uh, wow. In power, we have that. Uh, for us, in, although a lot of people consider neural network deep learning models as black box, but for us researchers, it's not a black box. We, we can go deep into the neural network, analyze the, uh, the links, the nodes, the variables, the parameters, mm -hmm. understand, say, okay, actually the nodes and the variables and parameters are learning dependency passing relationship between words. And there are composition ability, how to compose language, do syntactic net learning. Those are captured by deep neural networks. Mm -hmm. So deep learning are pretty powerful. That's one thing. Another thing is, if you think about the employee, right? When you train employee, you let them read articles, documents in the company, right? right. Uh, employee training, there are uh, unstructured documents, semi-structured documents, and your employee and you can say, look at our company's website. There are tons of information there. Our companies, for example, if it's a banking, our loan application process is there, right? And mm -hmm. you don't want to actually program the employee. Mm -hmm. uh, for every case, the employee can learn a lot from documentations. That's why um, the virtual assistant with the ability to actually digest unstructured documents, semi-structured documents, structured database, and knowledge graph and um, websites and the business process already in the company, as well as if you look at contact center, human, human conversation transcripts, those are all knowledge. Human are smart if they can utilize information, the same for machine, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why, uh, at least for our company, we actually build all those 
uh, data adapters to empower virtual assistants automatically identify those knowledge and you automatically utilize those knowledge. For example, by analyzing the transcript of human human conversation, you can you can automatically generate a conversation flow and generate a training data and say, here are the all times of training data, here are the intents, right? You can quickly start uh, the model and uh, and identify use cases. And also um, by analyzing the websites, by analyzing internal knowledge, you can auto automatically identify and some of the business process already there. It's there, right? You mm. don't need to manually program them, automatically, mm. oh, right? Yeah. And uh, are, are they learning this like in a goal-oriented fashion, <coughs> where, the, uh, where the the algorithm has like a goal or a task it has to complete, and then parameters to complete it, and then it learns uh, all of the company's documentation, and, and then it figures out the best the best way to uh, to, to accomplish the goal is that, uh, the, way to think uh, about it, or is that uh, the at this stage the employee doesn't have a task assignment yet the, the AI wow. employee worker the, yeah. uh, it, he's trying to gather information mm -hmm. right the information includes unstructured documents there it includes business process includes by observing human human conversation it it quickly formulates its hypothesis about what's the task flow, what's the business process? Where you see, usually people are manually design task flows. You see some of them, right? Even for the very good design studio, people are manually design it. Actually, we, uh, we have a data adapter and knowledge accelerator, also task accelerators, actually automatically generate those task flows. Then, and then also automatically generate, say, hey, here are some intents. Then here are also some candidate training data. Right, and then you can quickly utilize to speed up because that's that's how human are, right? Human right. learn a lot of things by observing, by looting, by reading, and and that's why we build accelerators to let AI workers do the same thing. Right, and so, oh, yes. Sorry, no, I didn't interrupt you. You can go ahead. Sorry, if you were in the middle. Oh, of go it. ahead. No problem. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Uh, you mentioned that you've been in AI for 25 years, and I think that's a remarkable amount of time to be in AI. I only know one other person that's been in AI as long as you have sitting right over here. Um, I guess my question is this. In a lot of fields of computer science, we see code reuse, and it's not something that we see in flatbot development. It's not something that we see in AI or digital assistance. We don't see any type of reuse of, or sharing of code. Uh, and there really isn't still any kind of standardization yeah, no library. in the libraries where you can draw from. Um, independent of platform. In the, yeah, pl platform agnostic is what I'm uh, trying mm -hmm. to say. You see that as being an important part of the future of creating intelligent agents, or do you not think that that's an important? It uh, depends. I, I would like to answer your question from a more higher level. That is where virtual assistant come, comes from, right? And you are assuming people are building virtual assistant with in-house developers, right? And uh, or or something. Actually, there are six different ways virtual assistant can be come from. The first, it can come from IT service companies, right? They uh, they provide um, customized solution for com uh, for enterprise or other companies to build a virtual assistant. And then the co uh, the company like T-Mobile company, those companies need a virtual assistant, need to have internal staff to support it. And the second way to get virtual assistant is to get in packaged software products. You have, uh, if the task, if you have a very generate specific task, and it can be packaged to you. Uh, there are vendors already providing those virtual assistants. You can just buy from those vendors. And then in that case, the company who need a virtual assistant only need to define requirements and evaluate packaged solutions. They don't need to build it. And the third way to do it is if your company actually want an enterprise-wide solution, that is, has the solution to provide a virtual assistant for all the business units, then you, you have, you want a, a solution that can provide complete system or cost functional boundaries and business units of the company. And you need probably those uh, usually from top down. Okay. And you can have external platforms to do it. It's very hard to internally build those uh, company wide solution from scratch. 
And then the fourth way is you do the cloud computing and get those cloud-based virtual assistant. And the fifth way is you do open source software. And open source software, if the support task is generic, and if cost is an issue, and if you as, and have an internal team, normally engineers want to do open source, you do it. And the sixth way is doing in-house development. When the resources and staff are available and you have the skill set, the system must build from scratch. And this is not just for virtual assistant, it's for all softwares. Okay. If you think about building a website or doing a, a other, other applications, those are six general, general way virtual assistant comes from. And when you're asking this question, you are assuming, I, I guess you are assuming in-house development. And actually, when I teach system analysis design, analyze a, where a company's so, so, software, where it comes from, that's usually the last resort. That means if the other, other solutions are not feasible, then you go in-house development. I think mm. this is, if you look at a web, website development, nowadays you don't want to deal with build a website by writing HTML code yourself from scratch, but, right? But if the, you, question, the question was not limited to in-house development. Mm -hmm. Even the five other cases, mm -hmm. okay? In the five other cases, the other available libraries, like you have uh, the JavaScript, uh, uh, libraries, you have objects that you can buy, ready-made pieces of, of, of uh, procedures that are packaged and can be ready-made. Like to the, is there such a, such a. Yes. Yes. It's, it's you, it's good. You ask that, uh, that's actually, uh, you probably didn't plan for it, but that's actually the positioning of our company, right? Because our company's position is we provide an all-in-one platform, right? That designed to accelerate time to value by democratizing AI to the point virtual assistants can easily acquire knowledge, skill, and the ability to handle complex conversation. And that's why we actually prepackage a, a, a lot of things. For example, like the human, uh, what we call uh, AI accelerator, the package solution for automatically analyze human human transcript and get you the intents and the and, and the training data and auto, and the business flow automatically analyze the website you we you provide a web link to the website right then it will analyze extract information from the website and you prepare a web link and say here is the process uh, where you apply for loan on the website then it automatically generates a virtual assistant that can do long. I, uh, although it's automatic, it generated, that doesn't mean there, you don't need a designer. Or finally, you need a human the designer to do the final touch. But we packaged all those accelerators so that uh, the human designer only need to do the last step instead of building everything from scratch. What That's is the why we... Yeah. What is yeah. The yeah, I have a quick question. So uh, I want to get this straight. So we could use a, 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 an accelerator, an ext uh, extensible, <laughs> to <laughs> basically uh, turn a website into a knowledge base. Mm -hmm. Is that about right? We can turn website into knowledge base, PDF files into knowledge base, and uh -huh. uh, we also have the can turn human human transcripts into knowledge base. Got. It. How much information does the website need to have, and what are the limitations in terms of like? Um, what types of questions you can ask. So as an example, like if I asked about Paris, right? Uh, you know, I could be talking about Paris, France, or Paris, Texas, or Paris, Hilton, right? So w w what are the limitations in terms of like asking a website a question essentially? Uh, so you are talking about uh, uh, sense disambiguation. Fortunately, uh, uh, first is yes, I would say our, our company is focusing on enterprise uh, company specific chatbots you know, instead of open domain chats. Uh -huh. I think open domain chats is a uh, totally different story. Uh, the technology will be different. And for mm, domain specific chats, then what you mentioned are less of issue uh, because uh, you already have the knowledge in, uh, right. in general, you interpreted what's ambiguous, as you said, based on the knowledge in the company's website, in the company's PDF files and doc and the human human transcripts. Yeah, and then that greatly solved a lot of problems. I see some of the companies spend so much time to design the process. The process is already there, right? Of course, you need to further polish, further polish the process. And because 
when people talk about it, then people might talk in a different way. Uh, I will say AI talk about it. AI workers should say it differently. But a lot of large amount of work can be done. Mm -hmm. Got it. And we want to open up the questions to the audience. So if you guys are having questions, this is the time to ask. Um, we have one from Derek. Uh, he wants to know, how would you rate Alexa and Google Assistant in terms of uh, the, you know, the five levels of, of uh, bots? How would you rate them from on that scale? Uh, so uh, depends on which you mean, because like uh, uh, Alexa and Google Assistant is not their plat dialogue flow is not right. If you look at uh, Alexa and Google Assistant versus dialogue flow team, the Google Assistant team is much much bigger than dialogue flow team. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it uh, depends on what you mean. Then uh, for the Google Assistant team, they have thousands of engineers can write a lot of things. Right. If the platform doesn't have certain technology, you can write code to code special cases. And so it will behave uh, handling mixed intent, context switching for the cases you handle specially written code. Right. When you say you can write code to do anything, you can write code to do a lot of things. <laughs> so there is no limits on the code part. Right. Uh -huh. But on the other hand, if you go to dialogue flow, then you uh, pretty much the dialogue manager, you need to handle it yourself. So the mixing intent, multiple, multiple, uh, multiple intents, how to handle multiple intents, how to handle uh, all kinds of uh, like a mixing, what we call mixing initiative people and those scenario where conversation flow deviates. And uh, for example, how to handle uh, the case user is asking a question, then you need to find the answer from a document. So it's not in the flow, right? You right. probably has never done that in dialogue flow. And all those things are left for you to write code yourself. Right. Yeah. Uh, you can, to some extent, of course, if you write code, you can do everything. But on the other hand, the hardest part is on the code part to handle those tough cases. I see. Right. Uh, and then what about from like the user experience point of view? So it, it's not you or me, but let's say it's, you know, one of our friends talking to Google uh, Home or Alexa. How would you rate Google Home or Alexa on the consumer level in terms of that, like level one to five in, in terms of the things they can do? Um, <clears throat> they are definitely not uh, level four, level level five, right? right? And so I would say their by default platform has level uh, level two uh, mm -hmm. because slot filling, intent prediction for level two, understand the variation of natural language is pretty much uh, uh, standard for Google, Microsoft, uh, um, Apple, and so on, other platforms, um, and that's the. Uh, that's a basic uh, AI people we learn. If you take a, a natural language processing course, yeah. especially if you take a di uh, dialogue system course, you know, we, yeah. which our university actually offers, and that's something you probably will do for your homework or course project. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, then, um, <clears throat> then for level three, um, as I mentioned, it's, it's partially there. It's partially there. Depends on how much effort they put into handling cases. Uh, I have seen common strategies handling um, co um, flexible of conversation flow for important cases, like the head cases. Uh, oh, that's also end up, and also for, for the knowledge acquisition part, and they also handle that. That's why they have huge team to do that. <clears throat> so, you get you a good, said, uh, you get good experience because they have huge team on certain tasks. And yeah. then you get a bad experience because for certain times, tasks, they probably don't have effort on it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. That's uh, so th this has been just an amazing talk. You kind of sent me on a little tan research tangent in the beginning of it um, to look up in <clears throat> the average um, the average cost for employment churn. Um, and after just doing a little bit of research, it looks like the EBN predicts around 33% of the average salary is actually projected to be lost from hiring that employee for training. And then also for them potentially leaving before a year, mm -hmm. um, which is just an amazing number to go on. I mean, the average salary is around 45,000. So it's like 15 grand um, that they're expecting just to lose. You know, they, they, they hire and they're going to lose that. And that's what mm -hmm. kind of they're projecting. And you're building the software and everything that you've been talking about is not necessarily how to mitigate that risk or save some of that money back, but 
to build an amazing knowledge base for a new employees to be able to interact with, because that's going to be a little bit of saving. And two, for that to be an employee of, in and of itself, uh, it's just amazing to look at from kind of a numbers perspective, because it, it gets overlooked like ROI or why are you building a bot in, in the first place by a lot of clients. And for you guys to, I mean, that's a pretty compelling number, 33%. Of, of the salary being lost. What are you guys seeing that you're either A, making up? I know that's kind of subject to the design and the implementation of the chat strategy, but what's what's like the overall goal for you on supplementing some of that lost or, or coming in there to help out? Supplementing the loss. <laughs> um, first, I think people quit jobs before various reasons. And if you p- put people to do boring job, Right. And uh, I think contact center, if you keep on let the people to answer those five, uh, thousand, uh, a question thousands of times and every day uh, for the same questions, they were going to leave the job. Right. And I actually think that's also the mission of a company is to say we are going to create a world in which the human and the smart machine collaborate to deliver superior experience. We, we actually emphasizing on the collaboration part, uh, which <laughs> corresponds to including how to, we actually has our customer um, building real, virtual assistant based on platform. We help them to train employees, train employees, coach employees, talking with their employee, for example, at this COVID-19 cases, like the HR yeah. bot COVID-19 cases mm-hmm. to help. On the other hand, as an AI person, uh, I actually think, um, you know, several hundred years ago, the same problem applied to automation, right? When people first introduced ATM machine, uh, they, people, people worry about uh, people will lose job in, in banks. And then it's different. People begin to do better jobs in banks. The same for here. And I actually think as we introduce virtual assistant, which we call AI workers, and then we can leave those better jobs, smarter jobs, that jobs that human is supposed to do to human. And meanwhile, if we run out of jobs, let's work three days a week. I'm fine, right? Amen. <laughs> and meanwhile, if this word, some people just get, a, you know, in US, people are talking about the universal salary and you just pay people, right? People get money for without work. I'm supportive of that. In the future, if AI is making money and our, if our company is extremely successful, uh, we can pay tax and we give, tax goes back to feed people. Right? Yeah. I, I'm totally supportive of that. Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well said. Yeah. Uh, counterintuitive question. It's probably a silly question, but is it easier to build a level three bot with you guys than to build a level two bot? Um, for, um, you mean with, our, with us? Yeah. Uh, le- Actually, we don't differentiate level three or level two in our platform. Because uh-huh. in our platform, you just provide the knowledge. For example, you provide the business process, right? Or also, we can crowd the business process. And then level two will support automatically. So the people who built the board don't need to think, oh, actually level three is supported automatically too. You don't need to think about the context switching. You don't need to think about uh, uh, mixing initiative or multiple intents. Mm -hmm. And the technical details were all hidden and the underlying technology handled that. That's why the bot out of box is level three. uh, It has all those, it has the technique needed for level three. Of course, um, then you, uh, in order for the bot to reach business goals, then you need to give it some pers- personality, right? And also uh, fit the right information. Yeah, so uh, we're gonna be, uh, we're opening up to audience. If you guys have any questions, please ask them now and we can direct them to uh, Professor Lee. Uh, so I have this, it's, it's a philosophical question. Uh, and I want to get your thoughts on it. Once you get to like, let's say a level five and you give uh, bot goals, um, is that a good way to get things done? Or is there just too many unknown unknowns and uh, unintended consequences? For example, let's say in the future, I'm talking to Siri and let's say Siri is a level five bot. And let's say I say that I want to, I want to buy pizza. Uh, and then, I want to just buy the cheapest pizza. Does that mean that uh, that you know Steve is going to order pizza from India and it's going to arrive three weeks later? Um, so I, you kind of get the idea of my question. Uh, yeah. 
is, is there like a limitation to goal-oriented uh, AI? And uh, mm -hmm. are, are, is, 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 what's the best solution to that? Would it be to know the person's preferences in a really deep way so that if I say, you know, give me the cheapest pizza, it'll have the context of like Stefan's in San Francisco. For him, a cheap pizza is $30 and, and taste is really important. So it looks mm -hmm. at all these uh, preferences that I have that are actually more important than the goal I give it. Actually, what you expressed is exactly the example. If the virtual assistant did a bad job, then that's a bad bot. That's not a good level five. Because level five means you need to acquire knowledge. You need to acquire behavior, skills. You also need to acquire preferences for com from complex instructions, right? And uh, sometimes or even from implicit past history, okay? And, then if a good level five virtual assistant should be able to handle the problem exactly as you, you described, mm -hmm. handle it beautifully. And a level five virtual assistant should be very rational, very rational. You know, even human, human, human workers, a lot of them are not rational. Right. <laughs> and the le level five, because they are uh, AI workers, only some crazy people build it, right? But the, a, a good human-like automation should be handle those things nicely because they need to understand learning preferences. Yes, and uh, we have a question from Richard. Uh, can you elaborate on how you crawl knowledge bases? So the knowledge bases we consider includes uh, the major, we, what we consider important information uh, in the uh, enterprise, in the companies with uh, our virtual assistant serve, that, which includes um, uh, unstructured documents. Think about on your websites. There are uh, FAQ pages. There are also a product menu. There are the descriptions about uh, your company. And your company has PDF files, doc files, right? You also have um, your company, if your company are using uh, enterprise uh, business process management software, then you have business process there. And uh, your company website, not surprising, you have a lot of application forms, a lot of forms there, they are all knowledge. And then you have your product database, customer database, uh, those are knowledge. And uh, your, uh, your, if you analyze your contact center, there are human, human transcripts and recordings, those are all knowledge. So my definition of knowledge is go from unstructured to structured, right? So those are all knowledge. Yeah, does it automatically structure them? into categories and so on? Like uh, we, a website so, using NLU to understand it? We, uh, we actually, so um, we actually, in our system, we have unstructured knowledge representation, semi-structured knowledge rep representation, and the business process representation, and, and also the uh, other trained models. What we do as data adapter is, because those are the models where the virtual assistant can use, and the adapter, what the adapter does is to convert to what's in the knowledge. Uh, uh, your company already have into a form format and also into the model that the virtual assistant can use so that when you chat with the virtual assistant, he, he can give you answers, right? By uh, based on like a documents on your website, like the manual of your product and mm -hmm. also FAQ on your website. And the, doc, the virtual assistant then can help you to go through the loan application process because the, your business process has those already information there. Mm -hmm. Got it. So we're going to do one more question. Uh, Jason, Dustin, if you guys have a question, you can you can throw it out there, or we can ask uh, the audience. I know there's like a couple or more. Uh, I have a question. So when you when you get information knowledge graph from uh, a source, and the the I come from a conversation design standpoint. How do you take that information that you just grabbed from whatever source you grabbed it from and, and, and make it so that it's not, doesn't sound like it's from a website and it sounds like it's an interactive conversational yeah. experience with a bot that is speaking in a consistent uh, mm -hmm. manner with regards to their personality? Right. So the current, let me talk about the current, what we have, and also what's the future, right? The current, what we have is, um, for example, we 
analyze the business process, then uh, what you normally have in the design studio, you drag and drop and design the flow. Uh, if you are using a state of art design studio. Okay. And uh, now when you open the studio, the flow are already there. The flow are already generated, right? And then there are some language there called from the website. But this is what we call final human polish, the designer's part. Then the designer will look at the flow and then fill in the missing pieces. Or your, if you need to certain system integration, you need to fill in the missing pieces too. Um, if the, you don't like, like the language there, uh, and change the language. I I, sh I would say ninety percent of the time, uh, you probably are okay with the flow, but uh, you are not okay with the language. So you want to polish the language because some of the language generated um, required uh, even for FAQ, but for task flow, especially for task flow, we generate automatically, and the language is too long for for this chat box. And uh, so we like in our company, we have designer and um, to uh, to polish those language. And, and by the way, we also have uh, upcoming um, training courses to train, train people how to how to do those things. Uh, if you are interested, contact me. Sorry, yeah. Professor. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way? And, and the, there are uh, two ways. Uh, one is you can go to our website. There is a chatbot there. You can schedule an appointment with the chatbot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the second way is my email address. It's yiz at iul dot ai. Send me email. Okay. Right. If you could share that in the chat, and then I, there, we still have a couple of questions from Arun and Ciro. Uh, you can also answer them if if you have time. And mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much for being a part of this. I, I enjoy every time uh, you know you talk, and I would love to do like a Q and A with you in the future. So. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, by the way, I forget to tell. Uh, we are offering a free COVID nineteen bot for companies, in uh, which people are free to uh, feel free to use. Um, you can customize for your company as a special thing. We are we want to contribute to solve this, help solve this problem. But thank you for organizing this. Absolutely, thank you as well.